Very good. I'm glad. Well, what an what amazing moment for us to um, share in as we visibly see the gospel um, enacted through baptism. You know, we believe that uh, baptism is a, an, an outward symbol of um, something that is um, demonstrable of an inner reality. And to hear how Taylor um, has experienced that inner reality of um, God's overwhelming love and his nearness and his forgiveness and um, his proximity to Taylor in her hardest of days and to see how he has made her and making her into a new person is absolutely beautiful to see um, and a beautiful truth for us to celebrate together on Father's Day. Um, my name is Dave, if I haven't met you yet, and a big welcome again if you are visiting with us this morning um, as family or friends of Taylor, or you've been dragged along by the, your dad by the ear because it's Father's Day, or if you're just here for the free and delicious morning tea after church, um, big welcome. Um, I'm proud to be part of this Jesus community. In fact, um, I get to chat to a lot of people about church. I was asked, how's church going? And um, it is always my privilege to be able to tell people how amazing this Jesus community is, the love that we have for one another, the focus that we have on serving the poor in our community, those who are most in need. It is an absolutely beautiful uh, family of which I thank you and I welcome you um, here to be with us today. And I pray that there would be um, an experience or perhaps there already has been of um, something of uh, the vibrant life of God um, as we meet together today um, would be a, a hope and prayer of mine. Well, we're in the thick of working our way through the book of Mark, but I, hang on, before I did get carried away, um, a couple of things to note. Um, one, the secret is out. I am a really good kisser. Sorry to all the ladies, but I'm a man of but one wife. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad that pops well done, hey? Um, <laughs> speaking truth. The other one, I think it's you, you, you kids down here, um, you might have noticed the haircut. Yeah. And... Um, the young people made me do it, actually. I was at youth a couple of, I don't know, weeks ago, maybe a month or two ago, and one of them ran over to the coffee machine, and they grabbed this. It's, it's, the, it's, the paint, it's the paintbrush that we use to clean out the coffee machine. They called it Dave. And since that moment... Every time I've turned up to church, there's been a, a deep wounding in my heart. And so I want to, here's the gift of Dave to you guys. We need it for the coffee machine still, so don't let it go too far. Oh, very good. Very good. Um, so yes, we are in the thick of working our way through uh, the book of Mark, Mark's biography of the life of Jesus, and we're looking at what it means, uh, or who Jesus is, and what it means to follow him. And in these few minutes that we have together today, I want us to see that in the pages of Scripture, that religion is not the solution to the broken human condition. I want us to see that true freedom is not found in following man-made traditions, but true freedom is found in following Jesus. And if I can really spoil the ending for you, following Jesus is not about behaviour modification, but following Jesus is about having a total heart transformation. And so to that end, um, I'm going to pray and we're going to dive in uh, to God's word. I'm going to move this before I step on it and cause some Damage. Sorry, Bredo. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that in your word we can see truth revealed. We see the person of Jesus. We see his character. We see his nature. And we see that how he represents the fullness of who you are, Father God. And Lord, we pray as we look at um, how Jesus interacted in this moment that we look at today. Father, that you would speak truth to us, that we would see that you are about healing us from the inside out rather than trying to fix us from the outside in. I pray, God, that we would see today 
in fact, that it is not about changing our behaviour of where you begin, it's where you, you begin in transforming our hearts. And so be with us as we open your word. Father, may my words uh, diminish and may the, the words that you're speaking to us today be the things that stick in our minds and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the story we're looking at today is found in Mark chapter 7. And we're looking at verse 1 to 9. It's really 1 to 23 is the the big chunk that this um, interaction all falls apart of. And I encourage you to go and in your own time this week, open your Bibles and go and read um, this in its fullness. But I want to throw some light on the first um, nine verses or so um, this morning. And we're just going to work um, our way through them Um, just a a little bit systematically um, as we go. The context here is that Jesus has been on the move. If you would have been with us over the last eight weeks or so, you would have seen that Jesus has been miraculously healing people. There's a moment where he cast out a demon from a a, a man who had a legion of demons. Um, We would have seen that we looked at Jesus' storyteller as he spoke about a sower and seeds and a lamp and a basket. Um, He has um, raised a girl from the dead. Jesus walked on the water. He took a a little boy's little lunch, um, just a few fish and a few loaves, and he was able to feed a cast of thousands with this small amount of food. And you can imagine that with all of this miraculous activity, that there was quite a commotion going on around Jesus. The crowds were beginning to swell. Attention was being drawn to Jesus. Um, And so much so that the religious establishment became more nervous by the day about who this Jesus man was and the kind of headaches that he would cause for them. And Mark 7, verse 1, tells us that a group named the Pharisees came to where Jesus was. Now, the Pharisees were the religious bigwigs. They were the self-appointed gatekeepers of the law and the traditions. And along with the Pharisees came the scribes. And these were other religious men who were well-versed in um, the Old Testament law. In fact, they prided themselves, and it was almost a prerequisite to be a scribe alongside the Pharisees, that, that you knew off by heart the first five books of the Bible containing the Mosaic Law, and they were able to recite it. They were to, they knew all of the, you know, the exclusions, all of the inclusions, all of the do this and all of the don't do that. They knew it all, every rule and every exception. These guys were the legalistic heavyweights. They're the ones that imposed the law. They made sure everyone abided by the law. They knew how to rebuke people when they got it wrong. Um, they, were, they weren't the ruling class, but they were heavily influential um, in influencing the social and the political and the religious landscape of the day. And the Pharisees and their law-knowing entourage, they made the journey from Jerusalem to where Jesus was. These Pharisees and the scribes, they came to evaluate Jesus' ministry. They thought, we're going to watch this guy like a hawk. If we can catch him out saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing, if we see him out of lockstep with Moses' law, if, you know, we, we can really throw mud at his name. We can ruin his reputation. We can drag down this whole um, thing that he is building and that he's going on. Let's nitpick to catch him out was what they were doing to eliminate the threat that Jesus posed to their religious establishment. And when they came to where he was, what they saw absolutely enraged these Pharisees and the scribes. It was meal o'clock. We don't know whether it was lunch or it was dinner or it was breakfast. But either way, Mark records for us in verse 2 that they saw some of his disciples, get this, They ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Amma. Didn't wash your hands before dinner. 
I don't know if you anything like my growing up. My, on re, like, you just knew it was dinner time when it was broadcast. Dinner's ready. Wash your hands. And there was always two qualifiers, properly and with soap. I, I, we needed the extra instruction. The outrage was because the Pharisees, and this is in the scriptures here in verse two, and all of verse three, sorry, and all of the Jews, they do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. Now, to be sure. Jesus and his disciples were not unhygienic. They were not filthy-handed delinquents that you'd be too embarrassed to invite over for dinner. As practical as the Bible is, this story is not about practical or personal hygiene. Having said that, kids, are you listening? Wash your hands. It's an important part of life. The outrage of the religious grand poobars was not because Jesus and his boys hadn't sanitized before tucking into dinner. The Pharisees were taking great issue with the disciples because they hadn't washed their hands in the right way. Their tradition was that before any meal, you'd follow a four-step strict routine of hand washing. Let me describe it to you. You would start by taking some water that is held in special stone bowls. You'd scoop at least enough to fill, and we use like cups and mills, um, they would measure it in eggshells to fill at least three eggshells worth into a vessel. And then you would take that water and you would pour it on your hands, starting at your fingertips and let it run down to your wrists. And then you would make two fists or one at a time rather, and you'd use this fist and you'd get your knuckles and you would use your knuckles to wash all the way up onto your forearms. And then you'd get the other side and you'd do the other one and then you'd get the three uh, eggshells worth of water again and this time you'd have to go backwards. You couldn't make it run from your fingers to your palms. It had to go from your palms down to your fingers. This was the way that you had to wash your hands. And a really strict Jew, they wouldn't do this just before the meal, they would do this in between every course. Like, man, that is a long dinner. Like, that's a lot of effort just to be able to eat. Such was the strict adherence to this tradition that apparently a rabbi who was once imprisoned by the Romans used his water rations that they gave him in jail Not to drink, but to set aside for this ceremonial cleansing to the point that the guy nearly died of thirst. But yet he was still lauded as a hero for his sacrifice. They even had an accompanying prayer that is said during the ritual hand washing. It goes a little bit like this. Blessed be thou, O Lord, King of the universe, who sanctified us by the laws and commanded us to wash the hands. I think we could bring that back for the kids. What do you reckon? For dinner every time you wash your hands. Blessed be thou, O Lord, King of the universe. What do you reckon, kids? Won't fly? (laughs) I mean, it gets even more zany than this rigmarole that they had to go through of the process and all of the rest of it. It wasn't just the hands that needed washing. They would get all of the cups that they were going to use for the meal, all of the pots and all of the pans, and they would go through a similar ritual of washing the outsides of all of these things. They'd even go to the lounges where they were going to eat and they'd pull out the baby wipes, probably not, but something else, and they would, they would wipe down all of the furniture that they were going to sit on just so they would be clean before they ate. I mean, if you're like me, we ask the question, why bother? Why bother go through all of this process just to be able to eat? Well, the reason that they did this is that they believed if you went into the marketplace, if you went for a stroll up into Cronulla Mall to get your coffee, 
If you dropped into Woolies to buy the, the bread and the milk and you came into contact with a sinner, then you too have become a sinner. You have become unclean. If you did business with a Gentile, you became unclean. If you exchanged money or goods with someone who was a non-Jew, you became unclean. If you came into contact with a woman who was in her uh, time of the month, in her bodily cycles, then you were also deemed unclean. There was so much that deemed these people in their view as unclean. If you walked past a grave or a cemetery, you were unclean. If you were so much caught a whiff of bacon cooking in the air, you would be deemed unclean. See, this whole hand-washing saga was not a matter of, of hygiene. There was no rona to worry about. This was their traditional ceremonial way of trying to make themselves clean, to feel like they were spiritually clean. Like this religious act of choreographed hand-washing somehow fixed the problem of uncleanliness, not just of hands, but of the whole of the person. And if we go through all of this song and a dance, we do all of these things outwardly to our bodies, then that will make us clean. And it is into this rigid, rules-based scenario that Jesus and his disciples rolled up for lunch and instead of going through all of the rigmarole of the ceremonial hand-washing routine, they did the kind of hand-wash that we used to do before COVID. Get the palm olive pump pack, squirt or two, quick rub-a-dub-dub under the water, give them a shake-off, use your pants as a little bit of a hand towel and boom, hit the buffet, off we go. And this made the religious big knob's blood boil. Absolutely enraged them. And they said to Jesus, verse 5, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of elders, but eat with defiled hands? I mean, they are pointing out that Jesus and his lads were breaking the rules. A strictly held tradition. And it is here that we see as plain as day that the Pharisees cared more about the traditions of man rather than God's way of doing things. And this is religion in its rawest form. Caring about man-made rules over and above God's intention and design for life. It is no accident that I'm preaching in thongs today. A couple of years ago, we had, I'm sure, well-meaning Jesus-following people in our church. And once I preached in thongs and they cornered me after the service to tell me that I was doing a disrespectful act to God and his word and that I should not preach in thongs. Rules made by man. And so today, I am breaking the religion of man-made rules. And I will preach in thongs. Bread, I did it barefoot, so I've got to, I'm, one of, I'm one ahead of you. That's not how it works. That's religion right there. <laughs> oh, dear. You know, it's important to note, no, that rules or laws in the Bible are not something that we can diss, that we can throw shade at because um, we see them as restrictive or we see them as limiting or um, as a way of taking away our freedom. Like parents do with their kids, or at least they should, they set boundaries, rules, if you like, for their children to ensure that they grow into life as healthy, flourishing, safe, honouring, responsible citizens that care for themselves that care for others, and that care for the world around them. And in the Bible, there are a whole swathe of laws that were given by God to his people to that end, that they would know how to be his people in the world. God gave rules to set boundaries and to set a way that his people would live in a particular way, that they would shine as a light that points back to his 
goodness. The most famous of which are the Ten Commandments. You probably know them, maybe you don't, but there's 10 of them. In fact, above the 10 or inclusive of those 10, there are 613 laws mentioned in the Bible that fall into like three big categories, moral law, civil law, and ceremonial law. We're not going into any of that. Some scholars, though, describe these laws as like fences at the top of a cliff, that God gave these, uh, these laws as a way to stop people and to stop culture and to stop society and nations falling off cliffs into despair and into destruction. Now what the Pharisees did over many generations, driven by fear, is that they saw those fences, all of those laws of God, and they said to themselves, we don't want to get anywhere near that fence, so we're going to build another fence. They built another fence in front of that fence. And then the next generation, even more fearful than the last, went, oh, gee, we, we don't want to get that close to the fence. We're, we're going to build another fence. And then another fence. And then another fence. In fact, it is said that there are 1,500 extra laws over the generations of the Jewish people that they placed upon the religious establishment above and beyond all that God had ever said or required of them to do. They believed that by, and this ritualistic hand-washing is a premium example of one of these fences. God never said to do it, but these guys were insisting on it. They believed that by doing this hand-washing song and dance in this very particular choreographed, scripted, religious, boxed-in, confined way, that it would cleanse you, that it would make you right between you and God. This hand-washing routine was a fence before the fence that was before the fence, a man-made limitation or law that clearly Jesus had no plan, in fact, I think probably took some delight in paying absolutely no attention to. This whole hand-washing saga portrays the essence of religion. The reliance on external things to try and make internal things right. Religion is like putting a band-aid on a broken arm. It has the appearance of healing, but it is unable to do the deeper work. Religions like, um, if you've ever sold a house before, and I know none of you guys would do this because you're upstanding citizens with great integrity, is that on a wall that might have a patch of mould or a ceiling that's, you know, a little bit... When you duck down to Bunnings and you get the fresh tin of Taubman ceiling white and you get out the roller and you just have a whack straight over the top of the mould, knowing full well that at some point that mould will come back through, but hopefully not while the potential buyers are looking at your house. There is a temporary fix, an external fix to a deeper reality. And this hand-washing tradition was exactly that. It was a band-aid on a broken arm. It was a slap of paint on a mouldy wall. This passage of Scripture shows us that religiosity gives Jesus the heebie-jeebies because it's a surface-level solution to a deeper problem. And Jesus calls these Pharisees and the scribes out on it. He doesn't just carry on with the meal. He sees what they are saying and what they are doing and the judgmentalism by which they are staring down their noses at Jesus and his disciples. And in verse 6, he said to them, Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites, As it is written, and he quotes Isaiah, This people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You guys, you guys have got a really fine way 
of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. All you're doing is making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. See, this is a right and proper dressing down of these Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus holds back no punches and exposes them and their behaviour policing, controlling, manipulative, power-grabbing tactics that they were. Legalistic, performance-oriented priorities that operated with total disregard for God and His ways, instead proffering their agenda and what they wanted others to do at the expense of others. Matthew, in his biography of Jesus, says of the Pharisees, what sorrow awaits you, you teachers of the religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, now, paying attention to everything external, fixing the things that you can see, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. I mean, this was an indictment on these religious men. Like no other, Jesus is calling them out. He calls them hypocrites. And we get the word in English, hypocrite, from the Greek word um, hypocrites, hypocrites, which means, get this, an actor. I didn't know this. It's where we get the word, the idea of being an actor or a stage player or someone who wears a mask, a pretender. In theatre shows back then, it was only men who were allowed to do the acting. And so between each scene or as the need arose, they would put on one mask to do their piece and then they'd slip backstage and they'd grab another mask and they'd put that mask on. And that's the definition of a hypocrite. Putting on a mask. Pretending. Putting something external on to try and portray something that is deeper. And I know you guys wouldn't do this because, again, you're all too good, but I'm on my L plates when it comes to this whole Jesus-following thing. Sometimes I put on a mask of busyness to hide feelings of inadequacy. Sometimes I put on a mask of positivity to suppress feelings of pain. Sometimes I put on a mask of stoicism or, or false strength to not show feelings of grief. Sometimes I put on a mask of the class clown, which comes pretty easy, to hide from growing up in the ways that I know I need to. And sometimes I put on the mask of an escape artist to try and hide from feelings of loneliness. And these are all band-aids on broken arms. I mean, I, it's a confronting thing for me to say, but am I one of these hypocrites that Jesus speaks of? Am, am, am I somebody who, out of religious duty, tries to cover up what's actually going on in my heart with external things? putting on the mask of she'll be right. That's one of my favourite sayings. That should have been on the thing I say often. She'll be right. But man, that can be a religious mask that I place on my life to give off the image that she's all good. These things are just a lick of paint on the mouldy wall in my life. A way to go, oh, I'm going to cover that up. And if I can cover that up, then maybe I'll be clean. Maybe I'll feel right with God. These are man-made ways of controlling life in an unhealthy way. Like I said, you guys wouldn't do any of that. I know it's just me. 
So thanks for letting me have an opportunity to get my stuff out. This is like the best therapy chair there ever is, being a preacher. You just expose all your dirty laundry and everyone's like, yeah, go you. It's not us, it's just you, Dave. Uh, I'm sure it's not the case. We've all got our stuff, right? Just our ways of feeling like we can become more whole by external things. If I slap a paint here and a Band-Aid there and a mask here and a mask there. You know, these are all modern day doctrines of man. Religious traditions that our culture have created and expected that we do. Ways of pretending and acting. Ways to look the part. To always seem okay. To grab onto whatever external thing we can, be it money, be it status, be it power, be it the promotion, be it influence, be it fancy brands, flashy cars, bigger homes, more radical experiences. These are all just exploits in being as Jesus described the religious folk. Beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with brokenness and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly looking like righteous people, but inwardly our hearts are not right. I mean, how easily we can fall into the trap of religiosity, of legalism, looking for wholeness and righteousness through band-aid solutions, getting stuck in the swirling vortex of being seen to be doing the right things, to be heard saying the right things, and being with the right people in all of the right places, subscribing to the right or popular ideas. You know, God has so much more for us than the temporary fixes that we have to our deeper problems. And the answer isn't in doing more of it and doing more of it right. The answer isn't in cleaning up your life before God will accept you. The answer isn't in being more perfect. The answer isn't in trying harder. The answer isn't in striving. The answer is not in performance. The answer is not in what you can own or achieve or experience. The answer is not in pretending, in hiding behind activity or passing some kind of readiness test before you are eligible to receive God's love. The answer is Jesus. And I'm sorry if that's a little bit too simple. But religion cannot restore our hearts. Only Jesus can. Man-made rules and ways of hiding cannot fix our hearts. Only Jesus can. In fact, Jesus, he had the right to be indignant with these Pharisees. The way they were peddling their agenda, creating rules, the way they were excluding people, promoting ideas that were not aligned to the intent of God's word. Their religion was an affront to Jesus' mission and all he was trying to do in the world. But I think Jesus was more or less angry and more heartbroken. Now, if I think about Jesus' tone in this moment, you know, was he, was he really giving it to these guys? Did he pull the gloves off and just give them the old one too? You know, was it, was it a, 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 a rage within him? Maybe. But I think he was less angry, more heartbroken. Heartbroken that rigid adherence to a rules-based system had stolen their joy. Heartbroken that striving for perfection had stolen their true sense of purpose. Heartbroken that in their hiding, they missed the truth. Heartbroken that they had missed the freedom of knowing God in relationship with him because all of their stinking rules got in the way. And I know that Jesus wants to restore your joy. He wants to restore my joy. I know Jesus wants to restore to you a sense of purpose. And he wants to keep reminding me of my sense of purpose. He wants to bring freedom into your life like you have never known before. In the same way he wants to bring freedom into my life like I have never known before, to know him and be known by him. And the way to that restoration, friends, is not in religious activity, but in the receiving of God's grace. Now we talk about Jesus versus religion. That is what is set up for us by Mark in the beginning of chapter 7. 
And here we see some comparison. Religion focuses on what you need to do to be right with God. The good news of Jesus focuses on what he has done for you. Religion quickly judges. Jesus freely forgives. Religion says, do for God. Grace is the humble acceptance of what he has done for you. Religion applies nonsensical rules to your life. Jesus applies freedom and grace to your life. Religion is a heavy burden to carry, where Jesus tells us that his burden is light. Religion readily condemns, where Jesus openly accepts. Religion makes you jump through hoops, where Jesus, he opens up his arms. Religion accepts you based on your performance. Jesus accepts you just as you are. Religion doesn't require of you the courage to change. Jesus gives you the grace and the tools to actually change. Religion builds barriers. Jesus, as we see throughout the scripture, tears them down. It's his favorite pastime. Religion adjusts behavior. Jesus transforms hearts. The choice to follow Jesus does not begin nor end with behavior modification, but with heart transformation. Jesus never came to start a religion. He came to establish his kingdom. A kingdom of light, kingdom of compassion, a kingdom of kindness, of love, of forgiveness, of freedom. Freedom from all the man-made hullabaloo that truly gets in the way of us knowing him. See, Taylor's baptism is a, is, is a real picture of what this looks like. You know, there's nothing special about that water. It's not holy water, it's not blessed water. That is like just H2O that came out of Warragamba Dam and through our pipes, and here it is. That water has no power in and of itself to wash somebody clean. But this is the gospel, that Jesus has gone to the cross for you and I, that he gave his life for our life, that he rose again three days later, that we too can rise again in the newness of life. And as we see the symbolic act of going down into the water, this is not a saying, I'm being washed on the outside and then my heart is made new. We have heard the testimony from Taylor as how God has met her in the quiet inner place, in the place of her wrestle and struggle and all of the things that all of us can relate to in some way, shape or form. And in that place, God's presence falls upon us with his peace and with his healing and with his forgiveness. And we see it in real time going down into the water is a way of saying Jesus has made me new on the inside. And there's a lot that people will tell you is important. And to be fair, there is. There's lots of things to be passionate about and causes to fight for and justice to seek, understanding to gain and growth to aspire to. But the truth of the good news is that simple. That he gave his life for yours and mine. That we could be truly cleaned on the inside. That he would take our unrighteousness and that he would give us his righteousness that he would take everything within us, all of the bad things that have ever been done to you and done to me. And he took it to the cross and he said, it is finished. As far from the east, east is from the west. He has removed our uncleanliness. He is not concerned with what we can try and do to put a band-aid solution, a mask, a thing that has the appearance of holiness and perfection. He cares not one iota about how you wash your hands or whether you wear thongs when you preach. Is someone going to tell me that I'm wrong today? Am I going to get shouted down after church for wearing thongs? If I, I hope not. The other people didn't end up lasting. So, <laughs> you know, Jesus didn't come to, to start a religion. He came to bring his kingdom and his kingdom 
starts in our hearts, where he brings freedom and healing in the inner place. And that then begins to shape our outward way of living. So I'm going to invite the band to come back up and we're going to finish in just a moment. And as I was thinking about this, obviously I was thinking about the own man-made rules that I shared some of you with you now about how I apply external things to, you know, mask the inner thing. You know, maybe there's an awareness that you've kind of just come alive to in this moment and gone, you know what, maybe I've been doing a bit of that. You know, maybe there's a little bit of this mask business I've been doing. You know, some of the external ways of trying to feel like I've got life together or that God loves me and accepts me. You know, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of striving in that to try and keep it up. But I feel like God just wants to give us some rest from that this morning. Just to say, be free from that. Be free from trying to look the part, be the part, do the part, say the part. Follow all the rules, tick all the boxes, cross all the T's, dot all the I's, get it all right. Be seen with all the right stuff and all the right people. Because none of that actually changes our lives. Only Jesus can. And so from experience, I want to pray this morning that God would give us rest from the striving. Rest from the doing. That we would truly come back to the simplicity of His gospel. And see what He has done for us and fall in love with Him. Because of His grace and His mercy and His kindness. Because He transforms our hearts our lives from the inside out. Let's stand together and let's just pray for a moment. Lord, I, I recognize that this, this hand-washing business that we've looked at in Scripture is um, somewhat metaphorical for our lives. That there are people who would want us to follow their way that there are all kinds of voices in our world that would tell us that we have to be a particular way. Whether it's social media or TV or advertising or political parties or whatever the case might be, we recognize that there are man-made things that try to give us a sense of wholeness and healing in our lives. I recognize that some of those things are okay. They're not bad in and of themselves. But Lord, I pray that just in this moment, that if there is any man-made tradition that we have elevated above the truth of your word, that you would show us that. That with your, your kindness and your compassion, you would meet us just now and you'd reach into the inner part of our lives, to our hearts, to our souls, and you would apply the sweet salve and the balm of your grace. And remind us that there is nothing that we can do that will make you love us any more or any less. That's seated in heaven, Heavenly Father. When you look at us, when we place our faith in Jesus, you don't see the broken Dave. You don't see the, the yucky Dave. You don't see the old Dave. You see Christ. You see your son, you see his righteousness. And Lord, I pray that we would grapple with that truth, that when you see us, you see Christ's righteousness in our place. And that is overwhelming love. That you would no longer count our sin against us. That your wrath has moved on from that. And that you welcome us to a life of true freedom and healing as we know you and as we follow you. So I pray that we would set aside any of the man-made doctrines and traditions that we get in the way of truly knowing you or that may keep others from knowing you. That we would know that there is nothing that on the outside that we put into our bodies or put onto ourselves that can make us whole. But just the deep internal work of Jesus' saving grace in our life. And so on this Father's Day, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for that gift, the gift of grace, the gift of freedom, the gift of transformation where it really matters in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.